our Father in heaven, we recognize this morning that we are a privileged people because you, our God, redeemed us for yourself. You have confirmed to us that you will be our God and we will be your people. Even as we considered earlier, you have sent your Son to do this. He is the one who dies in our place. He is the one who bears the wrath of God. He is the one who bears the judgment because of our sin. And by doing this, He makes us your people. He brings us into your family. We are yours. And we thank you, Father, that you dwell amongst us. And that you have promised to be with your people as they gather in your name by your Holy Spirit. And we thank you this morning as we come to you by faith. As we hold on to the promises of God, we know that you are with us. We thank you, Father, for this. Because as we come to you this morning, in the midst of the brokenness that we experience in the world, as we acknowledge our own sin before you, as we think about the ways in which we have been sinned against, we are thankful, Lord, that you are the one to minister to our hearts. We thank you that by your Spirit you meet with us, and he applies your word to our hearts, and he that reminds us of the covenant of peace that you have entered into with us. And that all of us, those who call upon the name of Christ, are happy in the Lord. We thank you, Father, as we reflect on those words, what is man that you are mindful of him and the Son of Man, that you look upon him. Lord, we are but dust in this world. And yet you set your love upon us. This is a wonderful truth. This is a glorious truth. That we who were once sinners, enemies of God, can now be called your children. We thank you for all the precious things that you have promised to us. We thank you for the, uh, the uh, never-ending riches that come to us through Jesus Christ that you pour out upon us. We ask, Lord, that as we think of these things, that you would encourage our hearts. We pray that the benefits of redemption would not simply be truths that we affirm, but we pray that they would shape our affections. We pray that we would have joy and an ever-increasing love for Jesus Christ. Our Father in heaven, we do also want to bring before you this morning those who are unwell, particularly those who have tested positive with this virus. We think, Lord, this morning of Denise, of Hazel, and of Dorothy. We bring them, Lord, before you and we pray that you would reach out your hand and touch their bodies and strengthen them. We ask, Lord, that while they are feeling the weight of these symptoms, we pray, Father, that even more they would feel the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that you would heal them. We pray that you would restore their strength. We pray, Lord, that we would be able to see our sisters soon. We also, Lord, want to think of many others who are unwell, perhaps those whom have contracted the virus whom we do not know about, as well as others who are plagued with various ailments. We ask, Lord, that you would be with them, particularly during this time, as we reflect on our families and on what Jesus has done. We also, Lord, want to pray for Megan, who uh, feels the implications of what has taken place in the last few weeks in a uh, particular way, as uh, she, Lord, is not able to be with her sister uh, this holiday season. We ask, Lord, that you would please nevertheless uh, comfort her heart as she spends time up here with Ellen and Margie. We ask, Lord, that you would please bless them and bless their fellowship together as they reflect on the goodness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, as we, your people, Turn very soon to your word. We ask that you would help us to feed on the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that our souls would be refreshed and nourished as we take hold of all that you have to say to us. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Please turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. Perhaps while you're turning there, just to say uh, once again that I'll be in my office after the service. If anyone would like to come in and speak to me or for me to pray with you, uh, please uh, pop in. As we read Genesis chapter 3, we'll read the whole chapter together. Although, really, we'll only be uh, focusing on a single verse. At this point, God has just created the heavens and the earth, and all that the world contains, the sea, the dry land, the birds of the air, and uh, those that are in the field. And so, when we come to Genesis 3, there's an interesting twist that occurs in the perfection that we find in the Garden of Eden. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, And he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig trees together and made for themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, She gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock, and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, And between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Then the man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove the man And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim with a flaming sword that turned every way to guard 
the tree of life. Amen and amen. We bless the Lord for his word to us today. Now boys and girls, how many of you are looking forward to Christmas Day? How many of you are looking forward to waking up on Christmas morning, running to the Christmas tree and finding your presents with your names on it? And then that afternoon, sitting down for a nice warm meal, perhaps some of you will have a a braai and relaxing for the rest of the day. Grandparents, how many of you are looking forward to seeing your grandkids again, spending time with them? Christmas is, of course, a very joyful time for us. This season is one that we look forward to every year. There's this cycle that we go through, don't we? We go to work starting in January, and from the day we arrive, we look forward to the time that we'll have some holiday when we get to December. And, of course, many of you may be under a great deal of stress. Your company may want you to close up any projects that you've been Uh, doing recently the books need to be closed and so there's a massive rush that takes place uh, probably that you're in in this moment and so it's very tempting for us as we anticipate a time of rest and of course our presence to be caught up in the stream that the world is dictating I've said this before and I'll probably say it every year into the future. When we approach Christmas time, there's always a Christmas within Christmas. There is the consumer Christmas. That's all about the toys that are on sale, the presents that need to be wrapped, the year-end parties that are uh, full of food and drink. And the consumer Christmas in the world is a very worldly affair. It's all about our passions, our gluttony, our desires. And that's something that we must stay away from. As Christians, we need to be very careful. We must be on our guard when it comes to these things. We must, of course, be very discerning. But not only is there the consumer Christmas, there's also the cultural Christmas. And this is what each family will do during this time. Maybe you want to have Christmas trees or not. Maybe you'll have roast or a braai. Maybe you'll come to church or not. These are all things that each one of us will need to work through. If you're a Christian, you need to think about how you can cultivate a time where you can have rest and and spend time with family. But of course, there's also, and lastly, this is the one that we must focus on, there's the Christ Christmas, isn't there? This is the real reason why the season exists. As we think about Christmas Day, we must reflect upon the incarnation. God in eternity past determined that His Son would be born of a virgin. He would step into humanity and take our place on the cross. The reason why Jesus is born is so that he can die. The reason why he dies is to take the place of sinners, you and I. And so it's important for us, while there's so much activity going on around us, to pause, to not be distracted by the world, to not be caught up with nostalgia, but to think about Jesus Christ, to think about our Savior. And so in the next few weeks, leading up to uh, Christmas Day, we'll be looking at, uh, I would call this a, a biblical theology of promise. We'll start off in Genesis chapter 3, and we'll make our way through some of the prominent promises that God has given to His people. This morning, I'll look at Genesis chapter 3, Next week, we'll look at Genesis 15, and thereafter, Zach will spend two weeks looking at uh, two passages in the book of Isaiah. Now, if you're taking notes or if you're following along, the title for this morning's message is Paradise Lost, of course, taken from John Milton's work. But the first thing that I want us to see in this passage is the God who speaks. The God who speaks. Have a look at verse 
14. In fact, you might even go further up, uh, further up in verse 9. After Adam and Eve have sinned, after they have rebelled against the Lord and His Word, it is God who reaches out to them. It is God who searches for them. God says to them in verse 9, Where are you? Why have you hidden yourselves from me? Why have you chosen to remove yourself from my presence? Now friends, remember where we are. This is the Garden of Eden. This is the exquisite paradise that God has created for humanity. This is a place of perfect beauty, a place of harmony and peace. This is God's garden for Adam and Eve. Now, of course, some of you love going to the botanical gardens, don't you? You like going out in nature. Perhaps you enjoy having a hike. Uh, but particularly when you go to botanical gardens, one of the things that we so appreciate about these places is just how well they're maintained. Uh, the grass is lush and always green. Uh, the pathways are well kept. And sometimes there's features that you can look at, whether it's a waterfall uh, or something like that. We appreciate these gardens because they're beautiful, aren't they? They cause us to relax and enjoy not just the environment that we're in, but the people that we may be with. But did you know that every botanical garden is produced and maintained by man? They may exercise a great deal of creativity as they care for these gardens, but ultimately they're the ones who need to work hard at it. Eden is designed by God. The greatest beauty that we will ever experience in this world is a beauty that is tainted by sin. Adam and Eve experienced something which we will only experience when Christ comes again. Perfect beauty. It is God who has created this garden, and it is God who made it very good. Perfect beauty, exquisite beauty, unparalleled beauty. And this is a place that Adam and Eve call home. They were the king and queen of creation. Everything was given to them. And then, tragedy strikes. In perfect creation, Adam and Eve, instead of listening to the voice of God, listens to the voice of Satan. They turn their backs on the one who has made everything good. The one who has given them great privilege and great honor. And they turn to the one who gives them false truth. They embrace the lies of Satan. And because of what happens in this chapter, the entire course of human history is changed. The trajectory of this world from this very moment in time is a trajectory toward sin. Everything is marred. Everything is broken, including ourselves. And what I find remarkable about Genesis chapter 3 is that in this cursed world, in a world where Adam and Eve turned their backs against the Lord, He still speaks to them. Now remember, friends, God is not obligated to do that. When He created Adam and Eve, He gave them the charge, You shall not eat of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Adam and Eve were the ones to rebel against Him. 
They were the ones who rejected him. They were the ones who listened to the voice of another. They listened to lies and deception. The fact that God speaks to them is an act of mercy. The fact that God speaks to them is an act of His grace. I think about this even in your human experience. When someone sins against you, when someone does something to hurt you terribly, what is your natural response? For most of us, our response is to recoil. We don't want to speak to that person anymore. We, we want nothing to do with them. At the moment, I'm involved, at least as a peripheral, involved in a matter of dispute between a church and an individual. And I keep saying to the church, you need to resolve this. You need to speak to this individual and, and bring this to a close. And they're just saying, we refuse to do so. It's so sad when that happens, isn't it? As human beings, when we're sinned against, we don't speak to one another. Well, God is sinned against. And yet, He speaks. Where are you? Where are you, Adam? Why have you hidden yourself from me? Even calling out to Him is an act of mercy. Calling out to Him is an act of grace. God speaks. And friends, let me remind you that God speaks to us today. God would issue the same call to us as He did to Adam and Eve. Where are you? You who are lost in sin. You who are trying to hide yourself from God. You who would live your life believing the lies of Satan and this world. Where are you? Why do you continue to hide yourself from me? Why do you continue to turn away? Why do you continue to busy yourself with other things? Looking after your pleasures. Instead of turning to me. Where are you? God is merciful. But friends, what we must also realize is that God is just. And what we find in the rest of the chapter, at least from verse 14 onwards, is God's judgment. We might say, the curse. God looks at Satan, and He curses him. God looks at Eve, and He curses her. God looks at Adam, and He curses the world, and Adam as well. God is merciful, that is true. God is gracious and kind, but God is also just. God will not be toyed with. He is a God of perfect mercy, and He is a God of perfect justice. God had said to Adam, the day that you eat of it, you shall die. If God would now recede on His word at this point, what else could we trust Him with? God is just. But we must also remember that when God is just, He does not respond in the same way that we do. When we are sinned against, our response is that of raw emotion. We become angry, we become volatile. But that is, not his, what, that is not what is taking place here. God does not render His judgment in an emotional way. His perfect justice means that He is also perfectly righteous. He will not do anything unjust. He will not do anything morally wrong. What is going on here is the judgment that comes about when Adam and Eve mar creation by their disobedience. By believing the lies of Satan, God now steps in and says to them, these are the consequences of your actions. This is the consequence of your sin. 
you are cursed. Humanity is cursed. Creation is cursed. Everything is not broken. Everything is not changed. Men and women forever will be separated from God. The world where we live in experiences pain and anguish because of what has taken place. And some of you know this. Some of you know the pain of broken families. Some of you, even in the past year, have experienced the sorrow of death. You know what it feels like when you're afraid. When fear surrounds you and consumes your thoughts because of what's, what, you, what you're facing at this point in time. Some of you know what it's like to be betrayed by your closest friends. We tell lies. Lies are told about us. We are treated unfairly. We see brokenness in this world each day we wake up. Doesn't, we don't need to look very far in order to see just how sin ravages our lives. We experience anxiety, stress, pain. We all know that our lives are fleeting. And very soon, we may all pass and see the Lord. But creation also suffers under the curse. Earthquakes, floods, famine, tornadoes, tsunamis, sickness, disease, pestilence, COVID. All these things are part of the human experience because of the brokenness of this world. It is a fallen world. It is a broken world. We can't just put a plaster on it and expect it to go away. And that's what the world would want to say to you. Just believe in the power of positive thinking. You can do this. Just put a plaster on this disease of sin. And suddenly you'll be better. Well, it sounds a bit devastating when you put a list together like that, doesn't it? It sounds horrific to be confronted with the world that we live in. But we also know that this curse is mingled with a sense of, of grace. When we experience life, we know that we don't always experience brokenness. There's glimmers of hope, aren't there? Moments when our children are born and we experience a sense of joy. Moments when we look out on the beauty of creation and we experience a sense of peace. We all have moments when we're proud of others because of their achievements. There are moments of joy in our lives. Moments that we don't want to forget. And I'm sure even as you sit here now and as you think about what are some of the moments in your life which are deeply significant, I'm sure you would recall many, many which are happy memories. And so as we live in this cursed world, we experience tension. Tension between the curse and God's grace to us. Because in God's grace, He doesn't allow sin to go unchecked. The world is not as bad as what it could be because of God's common grace to us as humanity. Each one of us are not as sinful as we could be because of God's grace, God's common grace in our lives. That is a wonderful thing. That I am not as bad as what my sin would drive me to be. Because even if I were an unbeliever, God upholds me. And so we have this love-hate relationship as we experience life. This love-hate relationship between the world and God. Because we love to go out into nature. That's why we have holidays. We gaze at the beauty of the stars. Sun rises and sun sets. We marvel at the beauty of flowers and the sound of birds. We can look at the minute details of creation under a microscope and be amazed at what it looks like. And we can look through a telescope and look at the details of planets and the beauty of the galaxy. And yet we reject the Creator who has made these things. We celebrate the man or the woman 
who has made the most of their opportunities. We stand in awe as they push the limits of humanity, whether it be in science or sport. We marvel at people like that. And yet we reject the one who knits us together in our mother's wombs. We're in a world that changes. We see incredible developments in medicine and technology seemingly taking place overnight. The things that we're able to do today compared to 20 years ago is remarkable. We thank God for something as simple as a flushing toilet. And yet, while the world advances so rapidly, we see a decline in morality. Murder just seems to be a common affair in our country. Adultery doesn't even receive a gasp these days. There's theft, abortion, lies. The sexual ethic in this world is almost non-existent. We love the world that God has created, but we reject the God who has created this world. We live in a world that is under the curse of God and yet at the same time upheld by His common grace. And yet, many of you still reject Him. Many of you still turn your back on Him and go along as though everything's going to be fine. Then suddenly God is expected to let you enter into heaven. God is merciful, yes. But God is just. So how then are we restored? If the world is broken, if you and I are cast out of God's presence, if there is nothing good in us to return to Him, how then are we saved? Well, we find this in the promise given to us in verse 15. The Lord said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. God speaks. When God speaks, He pronounces a curse. But in the midst of a curse, there is a promise. In the midst of a judgment, there is hope. One day, God says, there will come a child. There will come someone who will undo the consequences of sin. There will be one who will come, who will restore this world to its original beauty and goodness. There will come one whose name we know as Jesus. We might go so far as to say that what we have here in Genesis 3 verse 15 is the first record of the preaching of the gospel in the Bible. This is the first time God promises that there will come another who will undo what Satan has done here. But I want you to notice something, and this is something that I noticed recently. Who is God preaching to? The Lord God said to the serpent, and then jump ahead, there will come one, and he will bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. It's so remarkable when you think about this. The first time the gospel is ever mentioned in the Bible is when God pronounces his judgment upon Satan. And so when God brings in this promise that there will come one who will crush Satan's head, what we're meant to understand here is that evil and sin will be completely eradicated. It is not just as though God is only restoring humanity to Himself while evil forces still exist in the world. Every evil force will be completely abolished. Satan will be crushed forever. And even as we've been thinking about it, as we've been working our way through the Gospel of Matthew, we saw that, didn't we? Hell was originally created for Satan and his angels. The gospel is for you. The message of Jesus Christ, who dies in your place to redeem you from the curse, that is for you. That is the promise that God would give to you. But would you hold on to it? 
Would you, would you not take it with your, all your, your might and grasp it with all that you have? Would you not do that? But some of you treat the gospel as though it's this cursory thing that comes to you each week. As though you can continually reject it and reject it and reject it. And if you continue to do that, then the only place that God has prepared for you is the same place that He's prepared for Satan and his demons. Would you not come to Christ? The one who will undo the effects of sin. Well, how does the story end? How do Adam and Eve respond to this? Will Adam and Eve even be in heaven? Will we see them one day? Well, look at how they respond immediately after God speaks. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. What we're meant to see here is Adam responding to the promise that God has given. In light of this word, verse 15, there will come another. God, Adam then says, I will hold on to God's promise. And by holding on to God's promise, I will name my wife Eve. Because God has promised that through her will come the child. Now how do you respond to the gospel? Adam and Eve responded, but how do you respond? There's only two options here. You, you can't sit on the fence, can you, when it comes to Jesus? You can't suddenly think to yourself, well, I've got more time to work all these things out and somehow presume that God owes you that. You will either reject Jesus or you will turn to him. You will either cast him aside or you will embrace him. There's no middle ground. Well, it's marvelous there, just coming to the close then. It's marvelous what God does for Adam and Eve. After having said to them that the day that you eat of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, you shall surely die. One of the things we find in verse 21 is that another dies in their place. It is the Lord who makes for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothe them. Where did these skins come from? Not just poof out of the sky. Animals were killed. Animals were killed in the place of Adam and Eve so that they can be clothed. And in verse 21 is the first time after Genesis 1 and 2, where God makes something. Remember, God made the heavens and the earth. He made the sea and the dry land. He made the animals and the birds. Now, God made for Adam and Eve garments of skin. God is the one who deals with their sin and their iniquity. Well, God made him who knew no sin to be sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. God clothes us in the righteousness of Christ as we come to Him by faith. Just as Adam and Eve trusted in the voice of Satan and were cursed, those who trust in the promise of Jesus Christ are clothed. And from this point onwards, Adam and Eve live in a world of tension. They live in a world between a curse and a promise. Between the fall and restoration. They cannot escape this world, but they must live in it. But that's the world that you and I live in. We live in a world between the curse and the promise. Between the fall and restoration. We cannot escape this world, but we must live in it. How then... Do we live? We live not by trusting in the lies of Satan, but by trusting in the promises of God. What are those promises? All those who come to Jesus will be healed. All those who come to Jesus will be clothed. 
all those who come to Jesus will be saved. Or have you then? Have you heard the voice of God? Where are you? Where are you, those who are lost and hiding? Where are you to those who are sheltering themselves from the gaze of God? Where are you? Have you come to Jesus? Let's uh, spend some time in prayer, silently, and for just a moment. And uh, thereafter, I'll pray for us, and we'll sing, and then move on to the Lord's table. Let's pray together. Our great God and Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that while we are sinners, while we are your enemies, you still speak to us. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your salvation that is found in Jesus Christ. What a wonderful thing it is to know that in Him we have life. And in Him we can know forgiveness. And we thank You that all these things are seen in the elements that are before us. That as we come around the Lord's table in just a moment, that Lord, we thank You for the forgiveness that is found in Christ. His blood that was poured out for us. His body that was broken for us. And that as we come to Him who was naked, hanging in shame on a tree, we are those who are clothed with a righteousness not our own. While He was forsaken, we were embraced. While He was mocked, we, Lord, come to You. Father, we ask that you would prepare our hearts even now as we come around the table. Help us to do so with joy and with a deeper sense of appreciation than what we have known before. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.